right, so quick, uh, quick, quick recap. Um, the apostolic is sending and extending. They're pioneering, designing, innovating. They're working in an entrepreneurial kind of capacity. Paul, as an example to church leaders, sowed seed, sowed the, the DNA of the kingdom, and then watched over that and then appointed others to maintain that, which follows back to the first um, order of tend and keep. So it's a, it's, a re, it's a big $10 word, but it's a recapitulation. So when something is planted and, and given by God as a, as a, 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 a plan, as a, a method, and then that's lost, and then someone comes along and finds it and reinstitutes it, which 99.9% .9 of it happened with Jesus, who recapitulated everything as the second Adam, as, you know, all the things that were lost that are now found in him. Um, he gave these gifts to the church as the church was being planted. So we, in essence, now, even though we're looking at this, saying, okay, things are broken, things aren't working right, things need to be not repaired, they need to be recapitulated. They need to be brought back to their original intent. So... Um, so that's part of that, that tend and keep uh, mentality. Um, apostles need to not lead from a top-down standpoint. Uh, they need to lead from a bottom-up standpoint. Um, being apostolic is being fathering, being mothering. And parents do what? They protect, they provide, and they promote. So those are... Those are the, the responsibilities. And so, yes, technically, husbands are the head of the house. Yes, technically, parents are the head of the family. And that's true, and that's good, and that, but I don't, I don't parent my children out of the fear of reproof. I parent my children out of the love of virtue. I want them to do right because it's right, not because bad things will happen if they don't. So that kind of parenting doesn't ever have to pull the because I said so. Now, granted, you got two-year-olds, you got to do because I said so. You know, but we're talking about maturity and longevity Okay, in, in leadership. Uh, the prophet is the questioner, the uh, the embodying, questioning and embodying. So they they have a vertical focus with um, the Lord and the things of the Lord. They're, they're deeply, deeply committed to the integrity of God, his word, his plan. They're, they're very tuned in to his heart and his motive. Um, and they are a, an excellent voice for us to dial in to what God is saying in the moment. And those that don't believe that the prophetic is alive today um, and that the, that the word of God is enough, and, and I don't want you to freak out when I say the word of God, the, implying the word of God isn't enough. I know a lot of Christians who sought the Lord on what kind of a spouse to be, but not who to marry. They were discipled in being a husband. They were discipled in being a, a father. They were discipled in being a wife, discipled in being a mother, but they never sought the Lord on who they should do that with. There's a lot of people who have been discipled on what kind of an employee to be, but not where to work. And so, yes, you're supposed to be able to bloom where you're planted, right? You're supposed to be able to walk into any work environment and do ethical things and Christian things and biblical things and flourish. But what if God wanted you to work specifically someplace? What if God actually said, this is the person that I have tailor-made for your holes? <laughs> you 
their holes match your strengths, your holes match their strengths. I, I, I brought people into your life to lead you to me, right? We don't have any problem believing that God can, can move heaven and earth to get us saved. Why wouldn't he be able to move heaven and earth to get you who you're looking for? Get you connected with who you're supposed to be with. So for those that say, you know, the word is enough, I would, I would say the word is enough in the broadest sense of, I don't know what to do, what do I do? And the Lord says, do this in terms of character. But man, I need to know, God, do I buy this house or that house? Do you want me ministering in this part of the city or that part of the city? Do you want me living here? I mean, if, if God doesn't direct those things, then what's Jeff doing in the courtroom? I mean, you know, if God doesn't direct those things, why are you where you are? Why do you live where you live? So I need the Holy Spirit's voice in the now. I need the prophetic active in my life so that the, the who, the what, the when, the why of the moment is available to me. So the prophetic is very, very strong about that in the vertical of connecting people to God. In the horizontal, they're all about social justice issues. They're all about justice in general. And so the church needs to not be dismissive of that gift and then take those people who have those voices and just let them wander in life until somebody like BLM snatches them up or Antifa snatches them up or some other social, you know, Planned Parenthood snatches them up. You know, they, they, they're, you, you, we in the church, no matter what five-fold lens you look through, you have to stop, we have to stop, leaders have to stop being dismissive of behavior that doesn't align with the, the place in life that you have arrived at. Your life, your education, your maturity, your mistakes have brought you to a certain place. And if the rest of the world isn't there yet, God hasn't put you in a position to just be dismissive of everybody who hasn't arrived like you've arrived. And recognize that wherever you think you've arrived, somebody's way ahead of you. And that it's really, really, I mean, what, what do we do? How do we redeem the environmental issue? Do we just burn it and start over? Or is there going to be someone who one of the fivefold will get a hold of, will pour into them, will speak to them about being good stewards about being standing in accountability before the Lord and walk their natural desires into godly solutions. What, what do we do? The whole time I was watching the protests, the entire time I was watching it, I looked in the crowd and I said, there are future Pauls in that crowd. Somebody thinks they're doing the right thing for all the right reasons, just like Saul who murdered Christians. But thank God the church didn't give up on Saul. Thank God Ananias wasn't bitter. Thank God the Spirit was at work and could say, go to this place at this time and find this man and say these things. Thank God that Jesus loved Paul enough to intervene in his life. And the church is too dismissive. We have lost the prophetic voice or we only have prophets who want to tell us good things. And we, we have this like kind of weird Old Testament prophet versus New Testament prophet versus what used to happen versus now it's grace and it should all be positive and, and prophets should never tell you something that you don't already know. Um, okay, but I... I Yes, the most prophetic things in my life have been largely confirming. But I've had a few prophetic moments where I was told by God and I wasn't really in the headspace 
to find that out on my own. I was walking, and I, and I thank God for the people that have served in the military. It was not the path that the Lord wanted me to take. I was walking out my door. I was 18. I had my hand on the handle to go down to the Marine Corps recruiting office because I was going to get to open the door for the president. The guy told me that's what happens to people who join the military. They get these amazing jobs. I might even be able to raise the flag on the beach, and then I didn't have to do anything else the whole rest of the day till it was time to lower the flag at night. I thought, wow, what a great deal. Sure, <laughs> I'll sign up. Um, <clears throat> yeah, you're really dumb at 18. Um, but I literally had my hand on the handle. I was walking out the door. No, 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 no one in my family knew what I was doing. And the phone rang. Somebody in Tulsa, Oklahoma, working the phone bank for Joyce Meyer, dialed my number and said, I don't know what you're about to do, but the Lord says you're about to walk through a door that is not his will for your life. I had my hand on the doorknob and the phone rang and I said, do I answer it? Do I not answer it? And I was like, go ahead and answer it. I mean, if the prophetic isn't real, I wouldn't be here. I mean, I wouldn't be here. I don't know what I'd be doing, but it wouldn't be this. All right, so thank God for the prophetic. The evangelist, all about recruiting, negotiating, achieving. Man, they are the best asset. There isn't a person that an evangelist meets that is a stranger. I... I mean, put evangelists to work in your business. Put evangelists to work in your church. You can't shepherd sheep if you don't have any. And shepherds are really good shepherds, but they're not necessarily really good recruiters. Evangelists are storytellers. They, they've mastered, they just have that natural gift. They can turn anything. I know an evangelist who can stand in line at Jamba Juice and witness to everybody behind the counter because life with Jesus is like a blender. Okay. The pastor, again, shepherding, loving, defending, caregiving, and, and an attribute of the shepherd I think that is really important that's overlooked is forgiveness. There's a lot of senior pastors. That's why I don't use the word pastor. I use the word shepherd. There are a lot of senior pastors who don't have shepherding skills. But the congregation is coming with the expectation of a title called pastor to be shepherded. And they don't have the verbiage to know that the person in the pulpit isn't necessarily going to shepherd them. But if that person is not paying attention... They're going to lose people because people need community. And so you have to go find a shepherd to serve with you on staff. And it's okay that you're the head leader and you don't know everybody's name. But thank God you have someone who could in a heartbeat say, that's Betty, that's Tom, that's Sarah, her daughter just got sick, this lady over here just got diagnosed. Because why? Because then you can step in and you get to do your thing with information that you probably would have never had. And so the shepherd in a, in a work environment is, is like brilliant in HR. They're like perfect for that. And, and they're just, they're, they've got their... They've got their finger on the pulse of the heartbeat of the organization. They've got their finger on the pulse of the heartbeat of the church. I might tell you, if you don't value the shepherding and the, and the shepherd irritates you, which, hey, uh, shepherds irritate me, um, because it's, it's all about, you know, let's linger, let's wait, let's, you know, hang on, let's make sure, let's, we want everybody to come. See, the thing in a worship service I can tell in two seconds if an evangelist is the head pastor or I can tell in two seconds if a shepherd is, is truly, the, the senior pastor is truly a shepherd. 
Because all I have to do is just hang out and worship a little bit. I can tell if the lead leader is a teacher in a worship service. Because all the songs are straight theology. Songs with an evangelist at the lead, their worship sets are a mile wide and an inch deep. It's all about how you feel in worship. It's all songs about come, and we sang this song today, come now is the time to worship. That's a good call to worship, but it, it's not good deep in the set. It, it's, it's about, you know, a, a senior pastor who's a shepherd is going to look in the worship service and they're going to say, is it too loud? Is it too soft? Is it too hot? Is it too cold? How do you feel in this environment? Are you comfortable? Listen, there's nothing wrong with that. But if that's all you're doing, then you've developed a consumer mentality because we've removed the, the apostolic and the prophetic and in large part the evangelist. But honestly, the evangelist isn't as gone as you think he is. His senior pastor role is a seeker sensitive church because it's all about the ask. The entire service every single week is geared towards the altar call. Nothing wrong with that, but what do you do in a church that you have no one to connect to because no one in leadership identifies with what you identify with? That's why we have to have all five present. Everybody that is, that is an entrepreneur, that's a creative, that, that's an innovator, that's a, a, you know, just this man, they're, they're ahead of the curve all the time and they just, they've got plans and they understand systems. They need an apostolic leader to help them. And if the lead guy is a teacher, they're going to get systematic theology till they're blue in the face, but they're not going to know how to develop their apostolic tendencies. And, and pro ch prophet-led churches, that that's the only dominant thing there, and it's a three-ring circus and water on the table. There's no boundaries to anything, and you don't know what's going to happen in this moment or the next moment, and that's fun, and I like that, but I can't live my life on a tilt-a-whirl. I, I just can't, you know, and neither can everybody else. And so what ends up by happening is everybody, this, this new phrase called, you know, you do you, boo, you know, everybody, so let, that's great, you go do you. And, and then what, what do you end up with? A, a senior leader who's a prophet, and all they manage to do is gather prophetic people. And this entire church is nothing but prophets. And this leader over here is apostolic, and they just gather all the apostolic people. That's why we have been so intentional here, because what is the tendency to gather apostles and prophets? To gather that, that you know, we're, we're like really heavy on apostles, but not because we have intentionally built that. I, I'm, I'm constantly seeking the Lord as to what seat on the bus I need to be in in any given moment. Because we still have to shepherd. We still have to evangelize. We still have to teach. And whoever's best suited in the moment is the person who steps up. What if the whole church was built like that? What would that do for the kingdom? All right. Um, real quick with the, with the teacher, they're all about training. We, we need to give, I think the biggest takeaway from the teacher is you need to give teachers room to think, room to develop concepts and ideas, room to, it is the teacher's job to take the truth of one generation and distill it down and pass it on to the next generation. So they need time to wrestle with the big concepts. And it's, it's really, really important. Training is good. Training is beneficial. We can't all live in a classroom the whole time, but we are to be good students. You cannot be a good student if you do not have value for your teacher. You, you will just end up going through the motions just to get a piece of paper. But if you value your teachers, you will leave with an education and not a diploma. 
you won't just go through members class to just check something off your list. You'll want you'll you'll go through it, and a good teacher will will be able to impart the DNA of the kingdom and impart the DNA of the church and impart the DNA of the mission, and you'll know whether you're a good fit or not. But so many people have their eye on the platform or have their eye, it, it, you know, to, to do something. And well, in order to get to that hoop, you got to jump through this hoop and this hoop and this hoop and this hoop. Instead of a focusing on we need to develop culture. The fivefold is about movemental thinking. We're not just building a church. We're not building a brand for crying out loud. We're not marketing Jesus. We're building a, a, a river that's flowing, that's moving people towards the king. And that's so important. Okay. Um, the whole and healthy church, these are marks of a whole and healthy church. Whole and healthy marriage, whole and healthy business. This all comes out of the, the five Grace gifts, the apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, teacher. They're, you, you've, you've brought them into your life. You've surrounded yourself with them because you need to be equipped. You need to be edified. You need to be unified. You need to move towards understanding the faith and maturing into the stature of the fullness of Christ. I mean, if the fivefold's not for today, then explain to me why the church isn't fully mature. I mean, to me, it's, it's like with tongues. In Acts 2, Peter said, this promise is for you, your children, your children's children, and to many who are still afar off, as many as the Lord will call. If God's still calling, it's still active. When I was a child, I put away childish things. When I became a, a, an adult, I, I put away, or when I was a child, I did childish things. When I became an adult, I put away childish things. Fantastic. You know, tongues is like a cell phone. The gifts of the Spirit are like a cell phone. If you're trying to communicate with the, with the Father, do you need the cell phone when you're standing face to face? Okay, that's true. No, so put your phones away when you go home because you're face to face with the people that you love. All right? Now, I'm preaching to myself on that. Um, so... You don't need the gifts when you're standing with the real. The perfect isn't Scripture. The perfect can't possibly be the Bible. It's great. It's inspired. It's God-breathed. It's, it's the thing that it's the go-to. There's nothing outside of it. But certainly, the document is not more perfect than the author. So the perfect, when the perfect comes, that which is imperfect will be put away with. Okay, I'm not face to face with Jesus yet. Dude, I need all the help I can get. Jesus wasn't face to face with the Father on his earthly ministry. If he needed to be filled with the Spirit, I need to be filled with the Spirit because I'm certainly not him. He lives as that prototype. He lives as that, that mark that we're supposed to go after. So, we're, we're, you're, you need to be surrounding people in your life that are, that are bringing you into a state of perfecting, of mending, being perfectly joined together, putting things and systems in order, ethical strengthening, comp compelling, fulfilling, and healing. Do you know all those words in that list are the definitions equal in weight to the equipping of the saints? The word equipping in the Greek is all of those things. And what are we doing? We're equipping people on how to open car doors and smile. And we're equipping people to make sure that, I mean, we're handling people. We're equipping the church to handle people. And that's different than equipping the church to love people. There's, there's churches, and I'm so impressed with their, you know, hey, good morning, God's got a thing. You know, I, I got to tell you, I don't know what EMIC does. I don't know what they put in the water, but oh my goodness, 
from the time I ministered there one evening to the time I went from the main building down to the uh, after meeting reception for a night to honor Israel, I must have had 15 people. I'm not kidding you. 15 people stop and say, John, Pastor John, Stacy, it's good. We're so glad you're here. I'm like, there's no way that many people know my name. And they weren't doing it just to me. They were doing it to every single person who was a part of the program. I didn't feel handled. I felt honored. And if that's what you're imparting into the body, that's the purpose of the fivefold. All the voices are there speaking into you to become that person. You cannot silo in your main dominant gifts. You need to ask the Lord for opportunities to build upon your weaknesses. Prophets can prophesy without even thinking about it. Yes, they need to be trained. Yes, they need to be discipled. But mature prophets, they, it's like breathing. After I went through all my music training, I can get up there and lead worship in any state, any situation. I can feel like it or not feel like it. It's just part of who I am. That artistic side of me, that prophetic side of me is always on. But what I'm not are so many other things. So many other things. And so why would I spend my life constantly developing my prophetic gift that at 54 is pretty mature? I've been following the Lord since I was nine. I've been having visions and seeing things since I was nine and ten. So if I'm going to get jazzed about something, I'm going to go to a shepherding thing, or I'm going to go to a teaching thing, or I'm going to, I'm going to go to something that I'm not. That's the whole purpose of tests. That's why, that's why James says, count on all joy when you enter into a testing period. Because you know these things are going to work out these things in your life. The tests, those of you who are educators, is the test for what the kids know. The test is for what they don't know. The test is given so that you can better educate them in their areas of weakness. That's why the teaching gift is so important. That's why we need to yield ourselves to when the Lord wants to put us through various trials and testings because it exposes our weakness, which then we can take that to the body and we can, every joint supplies and carry one another's burdens and do all the things that churches are supposed to do. I guarantee you that kind of an environment, I, I, I mean, I say almost at a level of thus saith the Lord. The properly aligned and established fivefold offices brought back to the church will fix Every single issue in the church. It will. It absolutely will. If everybody's allowed to do what they do, and they're mature, and they work together, it will fix every problem. Every problem. Okay. Um, it, it's pretty easy to recognize how I'll put these up here just so those of you taking notes, you can take pictures of them. Um, the, and again, Apest is apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, teacher. Um, it's laced throughout creation. The apostolic was a secular term describing an, an empowered agent long before it was ever used in the Bible. Uh, prophets are described throughout uh, ancient and near Eastern culture and Greco-Roman world. Sage, you know, all those interchangeable words. Um, evangelists were called heralds. Shepherds were evident throughout the, the world and used in metaphors and roles in society. And teachers are clearly present in all forms of culture. Um, sorry, I'll get to that in a second. Um, it's, it's active in our social culture as well. Once we start to acknowledge that apest can be found throughout creation and expressed through individuals and organizations, we can begin to explore the possible implications for disciples in various domains of society. You're on your job as a 
person who is there to disciple other people alongside of you. At some capacity, you either have horizontal influence, you have vertical influence, or you have downline influence, and in a lot of cases, you have all three. But again, going back to what we talked about before the lunch break, you cannot change what you do not love. So you cannot just focus on, man, there's a lot of things around here. Man, I could be so apostolic and put that in order and put that in order and put that in order and just get stuff done, but break people in the process and break hearts in the process and frustrate things in the process. So you have to love what you want to change. And that brings me to the seven mountains of influence. I wish the church would have spent as much time crying out to God for revival as we did crying out to God for the White House. I mean, we need to cry out for the White House. We need to cry out for America. We need to cry out for a lot of stuff. We got elections on Monday. You need to go if you haven't gone already. Like, you need to be involved. I'm not that guy that says there's no room for politics in the church. I'm not that guy. But I am the guy that says, look at how much time, look at how much money, look at how much traveling, look at how much rallying we did. And we're not even remotely looking at our neighbor. We're not putting that kind of effort and intensity into our street, into our block, onto the floor of our apartment. We just kind of, we can kind of so easily compartmentalize things. Well, that's why this younger generation is having such a difficult time with their life because they can say, you know what, I can serve Jesus on Sunday and I can sleep with my boyfriend on Tuesday and I can party a little on Thursday and I can get drunk on Saturday and then I'll be right back in church on Sunday because everything's compartmentalized because that's what they've been shown. And we need to repent And we need to recognize that we need to be reaching into these places and influencing these places. If you don't like your school board and you don't like the curriculum that's being brought down through your school system, ranting and raving at a school board meeting is not the way to fix it. I love Jim's example when he's like, oh man, we blasted him and we blasted him and we told it all in the name of Jesus and high-fiving each other out the door. And, and he's standing there saying, dude, they, they stop listening after hello. Whatever influence you think you had, you didn't. You've got to let the culture speak to you as to what it needs instead of what you think you want to give it. You have to be aware of of listening to what the culture is crying out for instead of what you're determined to shove down its throat. So yes, we influence, and yes, we shift. But brothers and sisters, if you think the church is going to somehow rally in the 11th hour and take over all seven mountains, and then Jesus will return... That is not in the Bible. What is in the Bible is we go through and we endure and we take everybody with us as we can. What is in the Bible is that we we understand, I'll just read this, Um, there are numerous leadership typologies I'm sorry, uh, about the seven mountains. We influence, we shift. But Jesus is coming when the Father says go. And let me tell you what the Lord's not waiting on. The Father's not waiting on Hollywood to get saved. The Father's not waiting on Congress to call a solemn assembly in fasting and prayer. The Lord is waiting for this gospel of the good news to be preached to every creature and then the end will come. 
There's nothing in that except that. There, there's, there's no other thing that he's waiting for. Now, what helps us do that? Shifting media, shifting government, shifting education, working with people, influencing their life, trying to show them what the real priorities should be, where they should be putting their time, talent, and treasure, what they should be doing. Do they need a 10,000 square foot house while people in India are being killed, while people in China are being shoved into pickle barrels? Like, is that really what, you know, you're getting a mansion forever in heaven, do you have to have it here? Because I kind of read in the scripture when like, if you have it here, that's what you're gonna have. Like if you, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with wealth. Please, please hear me. There's nothing wrong with wealth. It's the love of money that is the root of all evil. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. I love what Benny Hinn said. God will allow millions to flow through your fingers if, you, if they don't get sticky. Because it all belongs to him. I mean, it all belongs to him. So yeah, we... We recognize that we have influence, but Jesus is coming when the Father says go. And our attitude and our posture needs to be that we are going to go through that time swinging, snatching, worshiping, whatever, because we have the promise of Goshen. What was Goshen? It was the chosen people of God who in the midst of judgment were spared. Now, I don't know what that looks like in your theology book to you. But to me, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to yank everybody out of a time when the world needs the church the most. Now, I'll just leave that there. I'll just set that right there. All right. So... These, uh, what I'm about to show you are are a a list from Alan Hirsch uh, in his book, 5Q. Um, And they are pictures of how you can just begin to see the fivefold, whether people know Jesus or not. Like this fivefold thing is so ingrained in, in, in the fabric of his will and creation that you're, you're going to start to see some connections. So you're going to see some names up here, and you're like, oh my gosh, why is that name even being uttered in church? It's because this is how they're functioning. And, and what if, what if the church had been able to intervene? Yeah. All right. So for the apostolic, it's very small, I know, but we'll go through it very quickly. The archetypal apostle, founder, general, visionary, pioneer, adventurer. The hero expressions in general culture. Breakthrough designers, innovators, entrepreneurs, paradigm shifters, cultural architects, organizational designers, movement shakers, makers, systems thinkers, business leaders, problem solvers, imagineers, and startups. The categories of intelligence are strategic, dynamic, adaptive, entrepreneurial. Other characteristics include strategic, holistic, future-oriented, power, uh, pattern-sensitive, innovative, adventurous, creative, idea, um, that's a small word, ideational, and design-oriented. The domains of society are typically business, politics, architecture, law, governance, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Now, I'm not going to go down through the list of all these people, but Steve Jobs, Joan of Arc, uh, William Clark, and Meriwether Lewis, George Washington, Edison, Genghis Khan, in, in myth, Jean-Luc Picard and Aragon from Lord of the Rings. Like, that's an archetype. That's this, that's this thing of, as to who, what, how does an apostle work? Um, the prophet is the seer, the warrior, the poet, the reformer, the questioner, the meaning maker. They're artists, poets, shaman, ethicists, activists, futurists, liberators, 
meaning makers, revolutionaries, advocates, existentialists. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. When you see that operating in culture, their bent is prophetic. And instead of turning them off or shutting them out, recognize that as you have stepped into the prophetic, they could too if someone would just show them how. So you connect with your network, and pretty. this is what the Nyes are doing out in California. They're going after these creatives. Why? Because they are that. And the Lord has blessed them in such a way that they can begin to formulate real environments where they can reach into, not to, not to save Hollywood, but to snatch people out who have a prophetic gift and could be used for the king in the kingdom. Now, if enough people get that, Hollywood will be transformed. Right? But I mean, look at some of these people that, that, that are, you know, super, you know, environmentalists, whistleblowers. Why, why are whistleblowers so important? Because they hate injustice. And we just want to shut them up and muzzle them and silence them and push them away. And it's like, guys, we'll keep getting the same results if we keep doing the same things. But look at some of the names of these people. Bono, John Lennon, Salvador Dali, Malcolm X, Doctors Without Borders, and my two favorite characters of Morpheus and Gandalf. But, I mean, it's not hard to see the prophetic at work. I'm trying to get you to see what this looks like on Monday morning. Because you've got a friend who's spouting off about something that you may or may not like or something that you may or may not think is even biblical. I guarantee you guys, the solution to the LGBTQ problem is a shepherd. Prophets and apostles pushed them there. Ones that weren't operating in love. Evangelists, the Turner Burn type, the ones that go down. We're loving people in, in Mardi Gras. We're loving them with God hates fags signs. We're loving them. We're telling them the truth. Telling them the truth straight. They may die tomorrow. Guys, that's not evangelism. That's judgment. And last I checked, the scripture was pretty dang stinking clear about judging the world. In fact, we're commanded by Jesus not to do that. We can judge the church all we want. We're fruit inspectors. We can say that doesn't line up with truth. You're born again. Knock that off. And they can do it to me. But I listen, why am I shocked when sinners act like sinners? Why am I <gasps> when I see something on television made by a bunch of heathens? Unless it's assaulting my spirit, it ought to break my heart. And even in assaulting my spirit, it ought to break my heart. Because just imagine. John Lennon's Imagine. Being a song. That led people to Christ. Imagine George Harris and my sweet Lord. Not being. About Hinduism. Not being about Hare Krishna. There aren't enough Christians that listen to songs all the way through. My sweet Lord, hallelujah. Oh, what a great song. I've, I've heard choirs sing it in church. They just leave out the Hare Krishna part. Because it goes from hallelujah to Hare Krishna. If you listen to it long enough. And imagine... Probably one of the most influential songs picked up by all the people in the prophetic realm that are just gravitating to it 
because it's a voice of an angst that they feel. And I don't really think John Lennon was meaning, imagine no heaven, imagine no hell, imagine no religion. I don't think he was saying that because he really wanted to imagine life without God. I think he was saying that from an angst that said, there's been a lot of people who have done a lot of things in the name of Jesus and screwed some stuff up really bad and hurt a lot of people. And I'm just fed up with it. Now, he could have been that guy that was atheist or agnostic or whatever, and that's fine if that's what he sadly chose to, to go with. But I, I, when you really press these people, see, we turn them off at the Super Bowl halftime. We don't even know their story. We, we don't know how to pray for them. We, we don't even care. Do you know how many people prayed Justin Bieber back to his faith? Now, had they just written him off, well, there's another kid who grew up in church and went the way of the world, another Britney Spears, another whoever, you know, Jessica Simpson, another whatever, you know, just another typical tragedy. There's so many people who say they know and love Jesus, and it just, it just falls short. We're not shepherding like we should. We're not evangelizing like we should. But I'm telling you, man, when, when you get some of these voices out here, Zig Ziglar, Seth Godin, Godin, yeah, Seth Godin, Oprah Winfrey, has there been a more secular evangelist than Oprah Winfrey? Has, has there been someone who has, who has espoused the principles of secular humanism on television more than her? And she's in the church. And as far as I know, still living with Stedman. And never did get married. And, and, and people, they don't follow her because her message is all that awesome. They follow her because there's an anointing on, well, anointing is a bad word. There's a, a calling on her to evangelism. There's a calling on her for this. And for all these other people and what they do and how they influence. The shepherd. I mean, think of, think of these historic figures. Nelson Mandela. Mother Teresa, is there a better flesh and blood example of a shepherd than Mother Teresa? But how many of us wrote her off because she was a nun, a mother, a Catholic? I'm telling you what, Catholic or not, that woman loved Jesus. She was saved to the bone. And she did stuff in his name that changed the world. And God elevated her to a position where she stood at the UN and wagged her bony little finger at everybody in the room and said, you need to be doing more for the poor. That's a high-functioning shepherd. People would, would, I mean, she challenged the world stage on abortion. People would want to give her money and houses and better equipment and better things. They would give her money, 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 and she just would... Pass it right on through. Pass it right on through. Say things like, I'm with the lowest of the low because everybody deserves to be honored when they die. Everybody deserves to be treated. See, the shepherd sees the image of God in you. And they're after loving you and tending for you and caring for you because you look like the face of God. Because you're made in his image. Even the ones that are tatted and pierced 
even the ones who we would normally say, oh, what a waste, what a tragedy. Why would they do that to themselves? Oh, I can't believe that. Listen, I can draw a hard line in the sand and not be a jerk. I can give tough love and have somebody know that they're valuable and my relationship with them is authentic and intentional. They may not like what I'm saying. They may not like what I stand for. But I have been with more young people, more teenagers and college-age students than I can shake a stick at doing things that I would never, ever approve of. But I love them because God loves them. Because for me to come against them is to come against the image of, I mean, there's something sacred about human life. Why do you think the abortion issue has been fought as fiercely as it has been fought? It's not because women want to be liberated and they don't want to be chained down to being a mother at home with children that they didn't ask for. The abortion issue is about snuffing out the image of God. It's the complete opposite of the shepherding ideology. And then lastly, the teacher, the philosopher, the sage, the ideologist, the scientist, the uh, disciplers, the debaters, the engineers, the researchers, the accountants, forensic legal workers. They typically are seen in education, science, philosophy, history, publishing, and engineering. And then an extensive list of Socrates and Plato and Einstein, Herschel, Keller, Hawking. These are brilliant minds. Could you imagine the kind of work that could have been done had these people been pursued by the church and pointed in the direction of God in their gifting? The kind of stuff that could be, I mean, the, 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 scientific, the, the more they learn in science, the more real the Bible is. And the Bible's as real as it gets and doesn't need scientists to discover something to validate it. I know more scientists who just by their discoveries landed on there must be a God. That shows that apest thing is even in creation. Because God will look at the adventurer and he'll show him the splendor of the mountains as he's traversing or she's traversing her way westward for new opportunity. And they'll see the grandeur and they'll be like, yeah, give me that. And the prophet will look up in the stars and look up in the heavens and they'll look down at the tiniest little thing and they'll just be completely mesmerized by how intricate and detailed and beautiful and phenomenal God is. They see colors when you play music. Like it's just, it's just a whole other thing to them. I mean, it's, it's evident in everything. Creation speaks to everyone. Proverbs says, go to the ant, O sluggard, and learn from her ways and be wise. That is such a teaching thing because I'm looking at the meticulousness of this entire colony that is constantly gathering and working together and and I'm, I'm observing something even in nature that tells me God is a God of order. He's a systematic kind of thinker. Guys, all of these things, hopefully now, are way more evident for you. We need to be building relationships and working with people that we would normally be inclined to dismiss because we have the responsibility to infuse kingdom viewpoints and kingdom ethics and kingdom principles into their everyday life. And you have no idea that your coworker won't be the next Ron Popeil. 
you have no idea that your coworker would be the next Carrie Underwood who was plucked up out of obscure, obscurity as a waitress and thrust onto an international stage. You have no idea. You have no idea if that kid that you're coaching is going to be the one in a billion that actually goes all the way. You have no idea. And so you need to be diligent in every opportunity that you have to infuse this apest five-fold thing. That's in everyday living. It's seeing the world from a from a bottom-up perspective, not a top-down perspective. It's seeing your role in people's lives as suppliers and mentors and agents of, of providing for them whatever they need through whatever lens you wear. And if you're all working together, you can shift culture exponentially, exponentially, way more than you would ever do just on your own, siloing your own disciples around you. If you're discipling people properly, you're telling them they need to be looking for the other four. They need to be interacting. They need to be interweaving. I'm telling you, we'd go on five years with this. And not one time, there's only two things that will bring all discussion to a halt on our leadership team. And those two things are, thus saith the Lord, and I can't get behind that. Or something like that. I don't agree. I don't think we should do that now. We'll talk about it. We'll run it by a few other scenarios and questions. If we still can't come to an agreement, it must not be that important. Oh, but it's everything to me. Yeah, but this isn't about me. It's about them. I lead to serve. That's how I lead. I serve. And so my job and their job and their responsibility and us as a team together are serving one another as much as we're here to serve you. And so if you come to me with an idea of, you know, we need to do this or we need to have this or we need to start this outreach or we need to do this event or we need to do this program, I'm like, excellent. Who can I get around you to do it? Oh, well, I can't. Uh, uh, <clears throat> well, God didn't give it to me, but you're the leader. Yeah, and my job is to teach you how to lead. So let's go. I mean, seriously, how would the church shift if every brilliant idea that God gave to its congregants initiated them to actually pick it up and run with it? Man, we'd be doing stuff all over the place. But I'll tell you this. It's a big downfall of people who are trying to get into this. They're trying to emerge into this, but they don't quite know how to get there. You're probably the only one that carries the passion for it. So when 95 people don't show up to the thing that you've planned, or the leadership team isn't at all of your events or all of your outreaches, either God gave it to you or he didn't. It's either your burden or it's not. So just drop it if it's not. Drop it if you were excited about it, but not burdened for it. See, I don't pick up anything in the kingdom that I don't have a burden for. Because if I don't have a burden for it, I don't have the grace for it. And there's a lot of good ideas. We have very, very little God ideas. And it's the God ideas that'll have the grace, the provision, and the stuff behind it to actually get it done. All right. Amen.